All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. morning. Welcome, welcome. My name is Luke Buchanan. I'm the current acting director at the Monage Informatics Institute at the University of the West Indies. Good morning, all. Welcome, and thank you for being early. Um, today, we're here for the launch of JCs, and JCs is a very nice acronym. It's for the Jamaica Sargassum Early Advisory System. And we are grateful for your presence, and I also welcome those that are joining online on YouTube Live. JCs represents a groundbreaking operational monitoring and advisory system aimed at alerting the public about Sargassum, offshore presence, and beaching. Um, it puts the country in a better position to adapt to the challenges of Sargassum um, in Jamaica. JCs is unique since it provides an opportunity for the software to be adapted in u for use in several other regions around the world. And later you'll hear from our colleagues in Ghana and in Mexico. And one of the challenges that we face in a small economy is that a lot of the times we develop tools that are not scalable. And um, JCs is definitely one of those tools that can be scaled to different regions in the world. I also want to, s to acknowledge special invited guests, um, all of you um, organizations that are from the private and the public sector. Um, I see a lot of uh, familiar faces here from ESL, Clean Arbors, um, et cetera. And I also want to acknowledge our colleagues from the RGR Communications Group. I see Krista and I see Mr. Sergio as well. Um, we really appreciate the effort that you have put in uh, reporting on environmental matters and also working with the Monage Informatics Institute over the past uh, many years. JCs is a result of a three-year program which started in 2019. Um, I would also like to highlight that JCs is funded by the Economic and Social Research Council um, for Global Challenges and Research Fund. Um, it's, the acronym is ESCRC GCRF. SATRAC is a result of a collaboration between the University of Southampton, UK, and we have Jadu um, from the University of Southampton here, University of Ghana, we have a representative from Ghana, the EPN Ghana as well, University of York, the Centre for Marine Sciences at the University of the West Indies, and Patrice is here, um, and of course, the Monage Informatics Institute, which is where I'm from, at the University of the West Indies. The objective of the Sargassum project, the Sartre project, is to identify new transformational development opportunities that build resilience, equitability for people affected by Sargassum presence and beaching. I also want to give you a quick outline of our agenda today. Um, immediately after my presentation, we will be presenting to you a video, which is really a poem. Um, that gives you an insight on Sargassum. It gives the two, it looks at Sargassum as a coin with two different sides. It's an environmental challenge, but it also gives us a lot of opportunities to use Sargassum for, um, Sargassum for a lot of solutions. Um, immediately after the video, you will hear from um, Nepo. Then following Nepo's presentation, you'll hear from Mr. Romario Anderson, who is our research officer at MGI, and he will give um, a rundown and give you details about how the system works, how you can sign up to the system, and how we can benefit from the system. We will also get international perspectives from our partners from Ghana, as well as from Mexico. And you will also hear more about the work that goes into developing JCs. Um, we'll also end by doing a live demo of the system and then my colleague, Mr. Darren Fletcher, will bring the closing remarks. Um, once again, we welcome you. Sit back, relax, and also have an open mind, because Sargassum has important implications for all people living in Jamaica. Thank you. We'll now move into the, the by the presentation of our colleague from NEPA, Ms. Monique Curtis, who is the manager of the Ecosystems Management Branch, and um, she'll be giving an overview of the challenges that we face where Sargassum is concerned um, from an environmental perspective. Thank you.
Since 2011, the waves have been washing in a new game for us to play. The tide rolls in with a choice to make, riding on its coattails. The details are simple. Two options for perception, two sides of the same single coin to choose from, and the familiar question, heads or tails? On one side, let's call this side tails. The sea sends in sargassum as the brown tide. This maritime menace migrates across the Atlantic, a pelagic passenger riding waves to make its way to our shores with whatever trouble it has in store, forged by climate change and fertilized by nutrients into rich growth. And its mischief won't just stop at the coast. Although, Golden sanded beaches are much easier to market than the stench of souring seaweed. But you see, sargassum doesn't just create a cosmetic problem. In fact, following our current trend, it is a triple threat to a fragile ecosystem. How the fishermen see less and less of the fish species, their local markets like the best and the day boat captains whose vessels will have to circumvent the seaweed maze lest their craft fall prey to a damaged propeller or a rudder's inner workings ripped asunder. Consider those living close to the coastline. When the air around them is infused not only with brine but also with ammonia and hydrogen sulfide whose health will suffer over time from prolonged exposure. And the inland population might not escape either if the sweat of sargasm seeps into the groundwater, how it can become a showstopper. Destabilizing a desalination plant in St. Croix to halt the production of water or creeping into a Puerto Rican plant to cut off the power. And if we want to talk cents and dollars, instead of thinking about foreign exchange from overseas adventurers, perhaps cleanup costs are the big line items we should have more care for. The coin is up in the air. And if tails isn't sounding so good, then have no fear. Because there's another side for you to mull over. One where trash could turn itself into treasure, where filth can be made into fuel or fertilizer, where masses of sargasm can be made into medicine. Let's call this side heads. Where a menace can be made a muse instead, used to inspire innovation and industry. And if you don't believe me, then I'd show you the people taking advantage of the nascent possibilities, the ingenious making sargassum supplements to feed their livestock, or turning the tons coming piled high into building blocks. The ones trying to add their seaweed stock to sustainable markets already on the rise, like bioenergy, like biodegradables, like the types of enterprise that could take a scourge and realize that they have the power to turn the brown tide into a golden jewel. This side is daring you to overcome the difficulties, to look at the challenges and decide to wade through uncertain seas because, although it may sound better, that doesn't mean it's easy. Supply may vastly vary from one year to the next. There will be challenges to overcome, to harvest and process. Progress will require deep research and all hands on deck because for all we know, sargasm could be Pandora's box dressed like a treasure chest. But even when constraints test your patience, the important thing will be the strength of your will to make a difference. This is a trial of ingenuity and resilience. So what is your preference? Heads or tails? Ghana, the EPA, as well as the University of Mexico, and Professor Dash from the University of Southampton. 
um, colleagues from other government entities, NGOs, academia, I see you, as well as our private partners, um, good morning, as well as to members of the media. <laughs> so just, just quickly, I want to give you an outline of what has been our experience as a government entity in bringing together persons to deal with the issue of sargassum um, from 2015, I would say, for Jamaica. So these are images that we would have been um, receiving from our local partners in 2015 when we had in Jamaica the first reported high influx of the sargassum. If you read the history, you would know that the Caribbean region, especially the Eastern Caribbean region, had been experiencing increasing volumes since as far back as 2011. But for us, in the local context, the records um, would show that from 2015, I would say that we started to have that high volume. Um, I, I, I must also indicate, and we must recall that the sargassum species is a native species to the Caribbean. And as the speaker said in the, in the video, it's the changes in the environmental conditions that have now resulted in that high volume that's causing the impacts that we're now seeing here today. So as far back as 2015, late 2015 into 2016, the government had started consultations with other, gov well, NEPA uh, had started consultations with other government entities entities and we had come up with a response strategy that is supposed to be an overarching document highlighting what was best practices in the region in other countries that were already responding to the issue of sargassum. So looking at what you would have to do to sensitize the public about the issue, also com to mobilize communities that were being impacted by the influx, how it would go about shoreline cleanup because if it is coming up on your beaches, there are considerations for sustaining those beaches, as well as the research and product development. And again, it goes back to what the speaker was saying, the whole cycle of what the response to Sargassum has looked like. One of the first things that we started to do as an agency was to communicate to the public. We started to receive calls, especially from beach operators, tourism players, about what was coming up on the beach and how they can handle it. So the initial response was to develop a sargassum guideline. And luckily for us, institutions such as the GCFI and CERMES had already started the research and advising um, regional partners and players about best practices when it comes to the whole issue of sargassum removal. So we basically crafted this document to the local context and we encouraged person from the start, if it is that you're sustaining cleanup efforts on your beach, we try to promote manual in the first instance. But in the instance there is that very high influx and I can tell you, one day you will be on the beach and there is nothing. And the next morning you show up, it is covered in brown um, algae. So at that point, we encourage persons to reach out to the agency and we will issue you guidelines that would allow for the use of bobcats and medium-sized equipment so that you're not causing that damage. So we have their different guidelines, whether it's manual removal versus the, the use of um, large equipment. So this is what we had tried to do. We had tried to spread the word and, and at every opportunity that we got, we engaged the media where the opportunity presented itself. We also had forum um, discussions with the assistance of other players that were now coming in into the response mechanism. Um, for those of you that don't know, we actually have a Beaches webpage that's hosted on the NEPA website. And if you go there right now, you'll see all the documents relating to how you can go about um, removing the sargassum from your beach area that you manage. So one of the things that we had started to do as well um, was to develop a monitoring framework 
um, recording presence and absence of the sargassum on various beaches. In any year, we could monitor up to 50 beaches on a quarterly basis using officers that were located across um, the island. And we focused on public bathing beaches um, with the assumption that the hoteliers would have been operating according to the guidelines on their beaches. So we would normally see the accum accumulation on beaches that were not being managed um, by larger operators. And with this, we prepared an annual report. Um, this information we've shared with regional partners so they're able to get an idea of what has been happening in Jamaica in relation to other countries. And I can tell you, based on all the discussions we've had across various regional engagements and agreements, the Eastern Caribbean has been facing it harder than we have here in Jamaica. Um, but we have been able to have that information exchange and learn from them. What we had relied on, and we still do, is satellite remote data that's generated from the University of South Florida. They issue monthly um, predictions, and this is the information that we use to essentially predict when and how much um, sargassum is likely to end up on our beaches. Um, it gives you a more broad scale prediction, and I'm sure in the following discussions you will hear how it's more refined in the system that's now being promoted or, or launched. But this in itself, even though the data is not as localized, it did help us to know when we should actively and more aggressively start informing local players about the likelihood of the sargassum ending up on our shorelines. Um, so as far back as 2016, we had successfully engaged the Tourism Enhancement Fund to earmark funds for cleanup activities. So where we had requests from local groups, and incidentally, most of the requests came from parishes such as St. Mary and Portland. In those instances where community groups were able to mo mobilize persons to do the cleanup, we were able to reimburse them for their time through the funds that were allocated by the Tourism Enhancement Fund. We were able to access that fund for the period 2016 to 2018. So that, that funding had come to an end in 2018. And in one instance, we had a very large cleanup at Hellshaw at an estimated cost of one million <laughs> Jamaican dollars just to clean one stretch of beach in Hellshaw. But the impact on the local community was so high because of the, the gases that were being emitted along that shoreline. So there was need to mobilize and get the cleanup done. And that was done in collaboration with the Urban Development Corporation. And as I said, it was at a substantial cost just to clean that one stretch of beach in that area. So another thing that we have been actively tracking is where the instances of high influx of sargassum will coincide with fish kills, um, especially along our southern coast in parishes such as St. Catherine and Clarendon. What we have found is that there is some um, likelihood of a fish kill occurring in some areas where you have a high influx of sargassum. Um, and this, as you know, is one of the negative impacts that's reported across the region when it comes to the sargassum accumulated in areas that are enclosed. Um, as a part of our response, we had tried to examine other possibilities um, that the government could look into or communicate to partners that will enable them to, to be able to respond to the accumulation in their localized area. At the time, there was a promotion of the Sargo boat, which is essentially almost like the mechanism that you will see coming out of Mexico, where they collect at sea. And, and this is helpful in the sense that it will reduce the impact on your beach areas if it is that you are uh, removing the sargassum at sea. 
again, <laughs> it came at a very substantial cost for just the design of the, the prototype. Um, and I think that is why this was no longer pursued. Um, and, and another issue with having one or two types of equipment is a matter of mobilization. Where do you now house this equipment so that you're responding to an island-wide threat, maintenance, and associated costs for having and operating a system such as this? So while the at-sea removal would be one of the ideal response in a situation, <coughs> Um, the cost to sustain it would have to be examined to determine whether or not it's really a viable option in your response. Um, one of the things that has been really helpful in the national context is we had reached out to the University of the West Indies, particularly the Department of Life Sciences and the Center of Marine Sciences. And through that discussion, we had further engagements with other departments, such as MGI, Department of Chemistry, Physics. Um, and what came out of that was an actual memorandum of understanding with the university to set up pilot projects to look at um, the potential use of sargassum in Jamaica. Um, that commenced in 2018. And essentially, we provided, the government provided seed funding to the university. And when I say seed funding, I mean not a very substantial cost. But with that, they were able to conduct research and come up with um, some results as it relates to the use of the sargassum as a fertilizer on crops and on mangrove seedlings. Um, I think up to last year, you would have seen the outcome of that. Um, Professor Weber has been in the media speaking about the outcome of that um, research, and I think the major finding was from that was the fact that in our national context, there's some amount of um, heavy metal um, considerations if it is that you're going to be using sargassum as a fertilizer. So now, how do you get past that barrier to make it and valorize sargassum in the national context? So we had other opportunities and engagement. ISEN's Scientific Research Council, they have all been exploring the potential use of sargassum, and that, that's in keeping with what's happening through the region. But then, for us, what exactly are the next steps? What is it that we need to be telling policymakers when it comes to governance and responding in a coordinated fashion when it comes to the sargassum? For us, the thought process is, once we're able to promote the uses, once we're able to get past the challenges in the national context, then the whole issue of innovation and entrepreneurial skills will have to be supported and promoted. Partnerships with local and private partners who will see the benefit in actually taking up sargassum as a product um, to be used in their processes. And, and with that, I will, I will end it there. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll leave that thought about how now do we tie in this system to a national response, being able to inform the process that will help private persons to essentially look into the use of sargassum as a possible commercial product. Thank you. All right, uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Um, so my name is uh, Jadu Das. I'm a professor uh, in remote sensing at the University of Southampton, and uh, one of the uh, co-investigator of this uh, SATRAC project, so which was kind of as, as a foundation of leading into development of JSONs and other activities as well. So this is first time in, uh, in Jamaica, and it has been amazing. You know, like the last few days, uh, the country and, and people are, are very good. So I must thank you for the hospitality, the team. And uh, so what I'm going to do is give a brief overview of the SATRAC project, so which has been running for the last four years or plus. 
and bringing together colleagues across the Atlantic. I think this is the, the key thing is to, 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 to highlight here is the problem of sargassum is not only kind of concentrated this part of the Atlantic, also affecting other side, including countries like Ghana. So this is first time we brought together colleagues from uh, universities uh, in the region from Ghana and join up with uh, institutions here to look into these issues. And, and one of the key objective of, of this project was uh, to look into going back to, uh, you know, like uh, the previous speaker, uh, uh, saying that how can sargassum be an opportunity for the poorest? Because this is, this is uh, looking into that, that again, the poem uh, is the side of the story where we turn a, a challenge into an opportunity. So there are some specific questions we started with the Sartrak project. So how we could extract values from, uh, from uh, sargassum. And the key was to look into the poorest of the poor because the, the funding for this project came from a source called Global Challenge Research Fund, so which was primarily aimed at developing research that would help uh, the poor people uh, in, in enhancing their livelihood. So particularly in the case of sargassum, we looked into how can we have uh, reduce the negative impact, how to build adaptive capacity and improve economic opportunities. So again, a lot of discussion around utilization of sargassum. So there are kind of, uh, uh, so, so just this is a nutshell the, the research about. So, uh, so identify communities that are affected. So we work together co-developing, you know, their need, understanding what they can get. And two of the key scientific question around forecasting. You know, if you know when it is coming and how much is the amount, then that will probably help to prepare, you know, the cleanup operation or think about uh, your, your utilization. But also look into uh, near real time monitoring and dissemination system. This is where JSAS came in. And because we have already got some kind of, uh, you know, some forecasting system, but they're quite core scale and give you a broad picture, but how can you translate that to more localized scale? And, and then looking into reuse options. So what I'm going to do is, I will, so this is the team. Uh, again, not going to go through detail. As you see, they spread across, uh, you know, like different institutions across the Atlantic. Uh, and my colleague, Emma Tompkins, is, is the lead uh, of this project here. And also uh, we got, we got uh, and then as, as you grow along, as you expect, the team kind of uh, uh, grew and we have new members and you know, like join in and we facilitate a lot of uh, interaction exchange between different partners, so to say our best practices. And that was one of the key as well, uh, opportunities to transfer knowledge. Because what we get uh, uh, understanding from here, how can we translate that to different part of the world? So uh, I will be covering uh, probably three key output to give a sense of what we have been doing here uh, in the Sartrack project. Uh, so, so the first one is looking into this long range uh, forecasting system that we developed in the project called Sartrack EFS. So assemble forecasting system. Then briefly touch upon the biochemical analysis and some of the work that uh, uh, in, you know, like uh, Professor Weber and a colleague from University of War, uh, York did uh, as a part of Sartrack project and probably complementary to what uh, you have been showing earlier. And, and, and finally, a bit more of, uh, of use of technology, uh, satellite data and, and other to, to look into uh, the sargassum and how it's work. Uh, we have a website uh, which is constantly evolving, so I'd like to you know, like, uh, uh, invite you to have a look into that and, and see uh, various outputs. So the first bit is the Sartrack EFS. So just to, just to highlight that there are quite other, as I said before, there are a few other systems around, but this is one of that we came out of the project. And the whole idea was to consider two aspects. One is to think about wind edge. So wind is a, is a bigger kind of factor, you know, like in moving the mat. And the second one also think about growth and mortality. Because sargassum mats, you know, like uh, they travel throughout, you know, like the whole range of Atlantic. So they're, they're kind of be between the cycle, uh, the dry and regrow, and somehow try to model that. And this system is a coarse scale system which try to give you a broad overview of how uh, much sargassum you'd expect, but in a longer time scale. So up to six, uh, six months in advance. 
And again, not going uh, through uh, quite detail. Uh, so basically, the whole uh, the, the key is to concentrate on the blue line. So which is saying is how much uh, you'd, you'd uh, predict. So that's a prediction. And the red line, uh, or kind of the, the MAVU line, is, is what we can get from using the, the South Florida, you know, like uh, estimation from satellite. So they are quite, you know, like uh, agreement in sense. So we are quite happy with the way the model have capturing the wind as information and other as well. Uh, the second uh, is we have now started putting it on our website, again, the Sartrack website. So where, uh, so this is for, uh, for, for Jamaica. Uh, again, you know, like the north side and, uh, and just saying how, what you expect. Uh, the kind of the greenish line is the, is the prediction. Uh, and then you see how to, what you expect over a long term uh, average. So that's, that's looking into that. Uh, moving next is the biochemical analysis, the utilization of sargassum. So again, uh, not going uh, in detail because some of things were, were kind of covered in the previous, but mostly looking into how we can utilize. So there are two uh, aspects that we uh, look into within SATRAC, mainly led by uh, uh, University of West Indies and Professor Weber is looking into the mangrove uh, restoration and looking into bioenergy. Uh, and there are publications. So one, of the, one of the key uh, output uh, 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 from the sargassum is a number of publications. We managed to contribute strong, significantly to the scientific literature. So these are just two examples of the paper that were published there. So looking at uh, bioenergy, uh, uh, so they, they did quite a lot of experiment where they mix of sargassum with different uh, material, using pli uh, also including pig slurries. And, and what was uh, the key output was um, when you use 100% of sargassum in, uh, uh, in kind of bioenergy, so they're not uh, able to produce very much of, of the energy. So, uh, so the, the recommendation was to use it as a co-digester with other uh, things like food waste uh, or, or you know, like, uh, other you know, like materials from uh, the grasses and those stuff. Or the second option was to use it as a compost. So they also explored the opportunity and, uh, and did a lot of uh, experiments in the, in the labs uh, and so on, and looking into mangroves. And different combination of sargassum were mixed up with sawdust and other uh, from different control conditions. And, and again, um, I think what was, what was found was uh, uh, the best combination, again, is not using 100% sargassum, but combining with other materials. So one of the best combination was 75% sargassum with, uh, with sand and soil, 25%. That provided the ultimate uh, or optimal growth condition. Again, again these, are, these are kind of opportunities that need to be explored further. You know, like there are uh, challenges in terms of the typical uh, the chemical constituents that we get, level of arsenic, for example. Uh, but there are, there are the ways where we can, we can try to overcome those and, and, and see some application where it's safe to use. So what I'll be focusing a bit more on the next is uh, looking into technology. So, so here, uh, the use of uh, remote sensing or, or satellite data or drones consider a significant part of SATRAC project in terms of monitoring aspect. So three questions, you know, like where sargassum is, so we need to understand how they're floating across, and then looking into how much sargassums are there. So looking into individual beaches, we utilize technology like drone, and, and there are, uh, at some part, we're starting to see different type of sargassum, different species of sargassum, and different decomposition level. Again, not just uh, using it as a whole, but if you can try to distinguish between different decomposition level, then that might also help with uh, their usability later down the line. So, uh, so all of these kind of work kind of feeding into uh, our kind of early advisory system and understanding, you know, like few of the physical factors. So a quick uh, overview of what we could do across scale. So this is um, uh, Barbados. And uh, this was an image taken like from a satellite, uh, quite, uh, you know, like you see here, you cannot see uh, as what's happening, just the island and, and the ocean with some clouds. But when you start applying some specific algorithms, like, like this one, so we are, we are starting uh, to see the sargassum mats kind of floating around it. And, and again, so this is quite a coarse scale, 
We have the NAR technology, so this is from European Space Agency uh, Sentinel data set. And then if you go uh, further, uh, zooming in, again, another satellite sources, a uh, bit more detail, and we can apply the similar algorithm, and then we see uh, probably uh, a much clearer pattern of these mats. And, and, and it, imagine the length of individual mat is kind of nearly double. You know, the one on the west is size of the, the, the island uh, there. And there are a lot more happening on the, on the east as well. And we now have, so all these data sets is free. So then the whole technology is how could we utilize this freely available information into a high resolution forecasting system. Uh, uh, just another uh, thing, if I could, if, if you could play the movie, I don't know if you could click on the movie t uh, to play on it, uh, because I probably cannot click. Yeah? Is it possible? Yeah. Thank you. So, so this is a time shot of uh, taking, um, no, probably you need to click there. Is not working. Yeah. So yeah. So this is this is again time sort of uh, of the satellite images just east side of your Caribbean. So the white box over there, and and the sense is if we start to regularly monitor these events, then we see like the the reddish pattern is the sargassum that is evolving over time, and and the whole sort is taken over two weeks, a two to three weeks period, and what you can see is the amount of variability that you get. So going back to the same point, you know, like it's not just a constant source; it varies. Quite, quite a lot across, across the scale. So the point here is now we have, through the project, we have developed algorithms where we can start to detect these patterns and that can feed into our advisory systems as well. We also looked into uh, beaches, again, uh, primarily a lot of work from MGI colleagues into, uh, into monitoring these beaches. And here we are utilizing technology from drones. And, and then, um, why drone? Because of the fine scale information that you want to collect. So again, one of the, probably one of the uh, longest record of sargassum of any, anywhere at high resolution that I can say. We have around eight or nine time shots of, of sargassum uh, beaching events. Uh, and that we are, we are analyzing to come up with a classification technique or, or something that you can apply quite straight away. So these drones are, are off the shelf drones. They're not kind of very specific, uh, you know, like uh, specifications. You use it, fly it, and then at the end you get information about the aerial coverage and information about post potentially about volume from them and then that feed into uh, your management strategy. So quite quick uh, way of getting that information. And then also, uh, with all those high resolution, we, we looked into uh, uh, an interesting area called severity mapping. And then, uh, so this is where we try to see, you know, like which areas of an island, specific islands, are affected uh, as, uh, as severe uh, compared to other. And what, because if you think Jamaica, not everywhere it is affected by sargassum. So there are certain areas are high, certain areas are low. We don't, you didn't have that understanding complete understanding. So what we did is we tried to see like what combination of the geomorphic feature that is present in land or the oceanic parameters that make a specific area more vulnerable to, uh, to sargassum uh, beaching there. So the focus here is more beaching. So a lot of other activities were more around uh, floating sargassum. So we are now moving to the next step where we are trying to predict the beaching sargassum. And then, again, uh, the work was uh, here. I should congratulate uh, the MGI colleagues because they led this kind of work to come up with this index called Sargassum Severity Index. And then they used that, uh, again, this, this combined lot of geospatial data set to build uh, a score, give you a score of, you know, like which areas are, are high. And, and they looked into each one kilometer segment of Jamaica. And within each segment, uh, they try to uh, combine a lot of different data to, to give you this, this, this score. And the areas which are kind of darker color, the purple color, are which, which, which you, you associate with, with high sargassum uh, beaching and the risk as well. Uh, and then, uh, as, as, as I said before, one of the key was transferring knowledge. So we started uh, exploring and applying the same technology. And this is, again, for the first time, uh, we are able to map uh, the sargassum severity 
across the Ghanaian coast. Again, my colleague will provide a bit more detail uh, later on that as well. And we start to see, again, capture record of long-term variability. So, uh, so I'll, I'll leave the, the kind of thrill of JSS to other, and then I'm not going to go in detail. That's one of the output that we'll be launching, and, and I'm, that's why I'm not covering anything on that. So in terms of the project, uh, just uh, the other activity is tracking. Because uh, we also, we know it's floats and, and that stuff, but we don't know how, uh, how much it goes and, and how the mat appear and disappear over time. So we use uh, some of those uh, uh, kind of, again, whole idea was to use of the self technology. So these are normal kind of GPS trackers. Uh, we put those into a, a kind of, uh, you know, like uh, homemade uh, system, so with a, with a plastic uh, bottle and, and, a, and a kind of uh, the chicken wear, and, and, and then try to deploy them over this Hargasom mat. And the idea was to track and, and, and how they're, they're kind of moving across the Atlantic, the pathways, because we don't have anything else to, to, to track them uh, except models. And we deploy across Caribbean, uh, de deploy around uh, seven of these trackers uh, last two years back. Uh, some of them, they're, they're because of the current and the, the size, the how it moves, uh, it didn't last long, you know, like a few days, they're, they're beast, uh, as you expect. But some of those, those travel quite a long way. A and one of them here, the, the one I zoomed in, is the one that was uh, deployed coast of, of Jamaica and then it kind of moved uh, quite a bit into, into, into kind of Mexican, uh, you know, like uh, coast uh, over there as well. So what we are also able to do is, at the same time, when the mat is moving, we know that there is a sargassum, so we try to get some satellite images at the same time. Uh, and then you start to see the different patterns. So A, B, C is, is when you, you start uh, at, at the coast here, and it was probably a, the same, same mat was only a smaller extent. Then the B is it started to, to regrow into a bigger mat and then start to distangle into it. So again, on providing that data about how the morphology changes is also also important indicator there. So, uh, so, so what we have achieved is uh, the three broad things within the SARTRAC project. So we, we managed to develop communication, effective communication across uh, the team. We, we always focus on core development, you know, like working collaboratively with the end, uh, end users. And also developing capacity, so understanding. For me, uh, Sargassum, I, I had no idea when I started this project. So I came from a more technology point of view. Uh, but my colleague, uh, uh, you know, like uh, Emma Tompkins has, has, has some experience. So, so then for me, it's a big learning experience over the last four years, understanding different types of sargas and how they move and how they impact and particularly talking to communities. Uh, and then that, that was one of the motivation factors for developing an early learning <coughs> system as well. So we try to do a lot of uh, podcasts. Again, these are resources that you could uh, go on. So there is a YouTube channel for Sartrack Project. And we have uh, 34 podcasts uh, talking various aspects of, of sargassum. This is one example where they're, they're de describing uh, the utilization and valorization of, of sargassum. We also uh, have a you know, like lot of meetings within the group. Again, the idea is we try to uh, share ideas, best practices, uh, and learn from each other. Uh, we, we have a lot of co-development workshops. And, and one of the things that we did uh, in Ghana and starting to do other, uh, in Mexico recently is to work with schools. Because uh, in, in particular in Ghana, the communities that are affected are a lot of coastal communities that they live next to the beach, a lot of them, and the schools and everybody, the, the children, they're quite, quite affected. So as a, as a project, we started, uh, and, and also, uh, there, are, there are a lot of myths, uh, 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 myths around Ghana. People don't know where sargassum coming from. They, they blame the government and all those kind of things. So educating, educating them. So we started producing some of those easy to understand uh, course uh, materials and, uh, and work with three uh, schools, coastal schools in Ghana, so that they provide that knowledge. Uh, we provide a lot of teaching resources. Again, the whole idea is make everything available to whoever who, who, who wants. So we develop uh, the teaching resources. 
and working with, for example, NEPA uh, or EPA Ghana just to look into how we can work with uh, our national government. As, a, as also, uh, uh, as a scientific project, uh, we have uh, managed to uh, produce quite a significant publication, as I said, uh, 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 more than you know, 23, there's still quite a lot of papers. And all of them, they, ask, they, 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 are, they, they work together across the team. And, uh, and also, that shows that we share knowledge as best practices. Within the project, we have different other aspects that came out, different projects like uh, more than maps, so we started the, the resources for training resources for different schools. Uh, we, we had a smaller monitoring project called MONISARG, again, which helped. Uh, at that time, there was you know, like some volcanic eruption that happened uh, in Caribbean, so we, we tried to look into the impact of that. We have uh, more of those citizen science program, and this is where we are moving into, kind of involving more the community, the citizens in monitoring of the aspects. So all those SARC-SNAP and SARCAP and SARTEC projects. A uh, lot of uh, kind of capacity building, so travel between different places, so not going in detail, you know, like, uh, so this is a, a meeting with, uh, with the community uh, chief in, in one of the villages uh, in Ghana, and on the, on the left, the Jamaican MGI team, uh, working with uh, the, universe, uh, the Ghanaian team to, again, uh, share some of the best practices. Uh, I mentioned about the school engagement, uh, and then, uh, and also, we have started something called SARG SNAP. So these are um, coastal monitoring sites, the station, so where someone can go and use a, a their mobile phone and take a picture of the beach, and, and automatically that can go to a server and, and kind of we can see uh, the status as well. So we are developing algorithm to automatically analyze those images. Again, we are starting to engage with uh, the school children first, you know, like again in their community, so that also help them an incentive to, to learn the technology and also think about, you know, like uh, the whole issue, the data science, the kind of that aspect the, as well. But also is a, in, uh, is a, is a, is a easier way to integrate uh, this information with their curriculum. So uh, again, uh, these are quite a lot of activities that, that, that we did, uh, uh, so, so not going uh, quite detail, but the whole, the point is we try to facilitate a lot of south-south capacity building. So we have, uh, you know, like colleagues from Ghana coming uh, to, to, uh, to Caribbean, colleagues from Caribbean going to Ghana, so kind of trying to share the best practices. So what's next? Uh, so over the next uh, six months, the plan is to look into um, consolidate uh, the document on the website. So, so the project, the SAR track project, will unfortunately end in, uh, in a month's time. But we will uh, try to uh, uh, provide uh, the website, the SAR track website, as the key source of information. We would be uh, looking into uh, a, a, a sum of licensing uh, agreement of, of, uh, of Jesus. So it will be a free license, but at least uh, to acknowledge the contribution of the team uh, that we have developed. So we will have a, uh, so we will work on uh, kind of uh, having that in place. Uh, and, and then start the conversation with colleagues in, uh, in Mexico and Ghana to, uh, uh, to, to implement. I think one of the idea is, and, and I'm really thankful to MGI colleagues as, as they're sharing their best practices with colleagues from Ghana and Mexico. So the next step is, is the scalability that, uh, that Luke mentioned earlier, you know, like, so scaling that up to, uh, to other countries and we can see the Caribbean best practices being translated there. In the longer term, it's more uh, uh, data collection. So that's what we're lacking. So we don't have a lot of moni good quality monitoring data. So involving citizen science is probably the be best approach, so where people can collect and share data sets. So we're exploring some of the automated uh, camera technology. So my colleagues will be here next week to install some of those cameras in one of those monitoring beaches. So we start to monitor them them detail. And, and improve, uh, basically, the JSAs. You know, like, so we get some feedback and start to improve and integrate JSAs and provide a bit more, uh, you know, like fine scale information. So with that, uh, I would, uh, yeah, I should thank all who has made this possible and, and thank you for uh, you coming here and listening and, and hopefully we'll have a following session going on. Thank you.
Good morning, colleagues. Um, all protocols observed. Um, my name is um, Mauli um, Beko. I'm from the Environmental Protection Agency, Ghana. And I'll be presenting on the Ghanaian experience as far as Sagasum is concerned. Yes, this is just a brief um, outline of the presentation. I'll talk about the EPA, that's the institution I come from. Um, I'll talk about our National Invasive Species Strategy and Action Plan. Um, we'll look at the background to Sargassum stranding on the coast of Ghana. We'll look at the baseline study. We'll look at um, Sargassum severity mapping in Ghana. And we'll look at other efforts to understand the problem or opportunities that Sargassum presents and then the way forward. So um, the EPA is basically the lead institution when it comes to managing the environment in Ghana. So it was established by an act of parliament um, in 1994, Act 490. And um, the mission is basically to co-manage, protect, and enhance the country's environment. And we do that um, through scientific research, technology, innovation approaches, and good governance and partnerships. So based on that, on our act, we have several functions, a lot of them, over 15. But one thing I want you to note that if you go through it, you see to advise, to coordinate, to coordinate, ensure collaboration, collaborate, issue permits, then you see a lot of compliance, acting liaison, conduct investigations, promote studies, research, service. So one thing we do is we collaborate with other institutions. We usually try to play the coordinating role to bring institutions together to help solve environmental issues in Ghana. To that end, um, we have what we call the National Invasive Species Strategy and Action Plan for Ghana. This is basically a policy document that um, deals with how the country is supposed to handle invasive species. And um, as you know, there are several of them, um, water weeds, water hyacinth, and all sorts of weather plants and animals. And you realize that Sargassum, as far as Ghana is concerned, and you're also concerned, you realize that it's an invasive species because it's not something which is like local to the country. So the main aim or the purpose is to provide a framework for the protection of aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems in Ghana and their native biological diversity of domestic plants and animals, including humans, and from, and from the risks posed by invasive species, as I mentioned. And this is a document which is um, running from 2020 to 2030, and to be um, had the, the mid-year review next year, that's 2025. So it kind of forms the policy framework within which anything we do is related to invasive species forms. So um, there are several stakeholders. You realize there are various ministries, research institutions, academia, etc., etc., all over there. But when it comes to Sargassum Stranding, um, the background is um, it became prominent in Ghana from 2011. That's when it actually started seeing maybe large volumes of it. And um, it's more pronounced along our western coast, which you see later on in some maps. And um, the peak season is usually a rainy season, that's between July to September. And then the agency actually carried out a study along the whole coast of Ghana. Sorry. Um, along the whole coast of Ghana. So um, I personally first came to contact with Sagasum in 2014. So I actually took that picture you see up there, the top left. And then these are other areas where we've had Sagasum strandings in Ghana. So the baseline study was specifically to identify the species of Sagasum we had in Ghana. And um, that is basically the whole coast from east to west. And the specific objectives were to identify the species within the coastal waters of Ghana, assess the socioeconomic impact of the Sargassum within the inshore waters of the coast of Ghana, and also recommend interventions 
to address the adverse effects of the proliferation of the seaweeds in Ghana. And as I mentioned earlier on, it took place between our border with um, Ivory Coast, that's on the east, on the west to Togo, which is on the east. And um, it was, they looked at basically um, about 36 coastal towns. And then, you know, they also did some socioeconomic surveys where questionnaires were also administered to find out what was actually happening. They interviewed um, fishermen. Um, we have this um, soil. They work with cleaning the coast and um, fishmongers, among others. The results, as I mentioned earlier, show that um, it became more prominent from 2011, more pronounced among the, along the western coast. That's from the border of Cote d'Ivoire to Cape Three Points. Cape Three Points is the southernmost post of, um, coast of Ghana, or the southernmost point of Ghana. Um, the peak season, as I mentioned earlier, July to September, and we realized that there are basically three species within our waters, and um, Sargassum flutians was widespread in 23 sites, and um, Sargassum natans were found at two sites. So because we realized that the beaching was more prominent on the west coast, that led to um, the research that I'll talk about later. So from the research, these are the impacts we realized. We have the clogging of nets and the outboard motors of the farmers, uh, of the fishermen. We have disruption of livelihoods, fouling of beaches, and that way it's affecting the tourism and then the livelihoods of the locals, as you can see from the pictures on board. Um, another thing that was carried out was the severity mapping, as mentioned by my colleague earlier on. And this was done, as you can see, in the western coast of Ghana. And then it was basically carried out in four major towns. We have um, Newtown, Bayin, Sanzule, and Esiama. And the objective was to assess and map the extent of sargassum along the western coast, estimate the volume of beach sargassum, and also determine the morphotypes and their balance along the western coast of Ghana. Um, they used three main methodologies. Methodology one was using um, remote sensing, planet scope data, where they did some NDVI calculations, Methodology two, and they did some drone flights also. And did the MVI profile across the coast. Methodology two um, had to do with volume estimation, as mentioned earlier, on where we had transects along the beach. Um, we flipped the quadrant and also did some drone flights using a DJI um, Phantom 4 Pro and a multispectral drone to determine the morphotype and the beach profile, as you can see from the images. Mm -hmm. Then methodology three had to do with um, the citizen science approach, SACSNAP, as mentioned earlier on by uh, my colleague, where we had um, three SACSNAP points in three communities. Within these communities, what we did was um, we set up the SACSNAP points, and then we had interactions with the teachers, the community, and the school <coughs> children took them through how to use the SAC snap points, how to take the pictures. And as mentioned earlier, we also developed some training materials for them. So these are the results. We realized that beaching varies across the site, and it was also confirmed from field visits in 2021. And then we had less beaching at Newtown, that is the westmost point next to Cote d'Ivoire. And then there was more beaching at Benin, Sanzule, and Esiama, and these were the study towns and the towns where we have the SAC snap points. Then, as you can see, there were three main morphotypes identified. We have the S. natans 1, S. natans 8, and then S. flutans 2, which was the dominant type. So other efforts to understand the problem or opportunity, as, you, as it has been mentioned earlier, it could be a problem or it could be an opportunity, depending on how you look at it. So as I mentioned, we had community engagement, we had a training of um, teachers, training their school children, We've also had the webinars on the issue. We have um, people doing their masters and PhDs 
to look at the issue of sargassum in Ghana. For instance, one is looking at the toxicity levels of the sargassum so that you can know what opportunities can come from using it. Um, we, there are a lot of educational informative videos on YouTube. There are various websites, the SATRAC websites. You can get some of the work that has been done in Ghana also on that site. The development of teaching materials, as mentioned earlier, to enable the ch school children to understand the issue. And then also the involvement of local authorities, as mentioned earlier. We try to make sure that the chiefs are part of the process, so that way they are able to move the process without any bottlenecks. So for the way forward for Ghana, we are going to continue monitoring using the satellite images. We are also going to continue with the drone service and in-situ measurements. And then we are trying to establish some new SAC-SNAP, co-SNAP monitoring points and in other areas. And then we are looking at developing um, an early warning system, which is the JCs. We call it an early warning system, but over here it's known as the JCs. So this is going to help us to be able to beforehand see where the sargassum is coming, when it's coming, where it's beaching, and then that way we can advise those who use the resources along the beach as to what they need to do. And um, as you can see, the red dot over here, I don't know if this has a pointer. This is Ghana, and this is Jamaica. You see the distance between them, but we are having the same issues. So I've flown all the way down here to come and learn from what our friends in Mona are doing, so that we can also go back and then replicate those solutions in Ghana. And um, these are the, those involved who have helped get us this far as far as Agassium research and monitoring in Ghana is concerned. And I'll just end by showing you some of the pictures of the field work that we do. You can see the Sargassum we've been getting along the coast. So this is how thick we can also get it in Ghana up to knee level. It's not as much as you guys have over here, but <laughs> <laughs> considering the where it's coming from and where it's going, it could get worse. So we need to actually have the early warning, the JC system in place in Ghana to be able to know when it's coming and then know the volumes. So this is some of the capacity building programs. Here we have um, training of teachers. This is the SAT track team. And some of us doing some field work over there. And you can see one of the SACs now points here, preparing for a drone flight, doing some analysis on the sargassum. And then here we are having some interaction with some of the school children in the communities. That's what I have for you. Thank you. Hi, thank you. It's a pleasure and an honor for me to be here um, from Mexico, the National University of Mexico. Um, um, I'm going to talk about a little bit of research that has been done in the Instituto Engineering Institute. Uh, Mexico has a lot of research about sargassum, but well, here we are focusing on what we have been doing. Next, please. Ah, no, I have the control in here, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> So, well, there are a lot of collaborators with this um, research. Um, it's a big team, basically, on um, physics. Um, there are people doing that kind of, oh, sorry. I don't know what I did. Okay, so um, what we have been doing is um, from satellite detection, from physical modeling, numerical modeling, and like in at different scales. Um, basically, a lot of work that is been um, uh, uh, that has been um, collaborated with uh, a lot of people in here. Uh, finally, the citizen science that has been talked about here. So, which one is the, the right button? Okay, there we go. So. 
from satellites to ocean currents to the beaching of sargassum, we have been doing a lot of um, research. And I'm going to talk about very quickly about those because we have just a few time. Point that that way, okay. So uh, what we have been doing for satellite detections, and we have a lot of uh, advances in here, it's uh, the classification of high resolution imagery, trying to incorporate spatial and form attributes to minimize false uh, detections, because we have uh, knowledge that those false uh, detections can be duplicated or triplicated or maybe uh, multiplied by many times the the quantities that has been detected by satellites. Um, we, we are currently working on complete long time series for, um, for those, uh, for, the, for, for the whole area. Okay, so the, the, main, the main idea trying to improve detection is, why, um, is because, this one. This one. Ah, okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, because the the regular use um, images that are from kilometers, we want to know how that uh, it uh, how the sargassum is in the coast of Mexico. Uh, as you can see over the coast. Um, we have this uh, saturated signal, and we didn't know how the sargassum is really over there. So we move from one index to several index to improve those detections. Okay, we have that. So the result set uh, right now is a multi-index approach that uses spatial and shape attributes to obtain binary vectorized uh, data. So we can just have this, um, we have sargassum or we don't have sargassum, and transform that in long-term uh, time series so we can have the, the idea on the area, on the whole area, how much sargassum is on sea. Um, so with the, this long time series, we uh, discover, or we analyze spatial patterns so we can understand where um, the sargassum is being um, advanced, um, accumulated, uh, where are our hotspots of uh, accumulation of sargassum. We, we have divided the coast in, in several segments so we can analyze and we know now now know that Cozumel and the northern part of the coastal of Caribbean and Mexican Caribbean is the most impacted one. But as you can see, the whole coast has been impacted by sargassum along the years. This analysis comes from 2013 up to 2020, and the patterns haven't changed much since the beginning. So, um, uh, well, Temporal, we have a lot of um, variation in, in terms of the time. So um, Mexico have implemented a regular, 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 uh, regular, no, say, say, um, a regulator, regulators. Um, so they they said that people can put barriers on sea only on summer because summer is the season of sargassum. So we have to prove that sargassum can be on beach almost uh, at any time, because there were um, economic costs, because the barriers weren't there, and then sargassum comes. So we have to, to prove that sargasso is, sargasso can be on sea, maybe uh, along the year, and the factors that could be affect the arrival is the, is, uh, is the, are the questions. So for trying to understand how sargasso moves and how sargasso is transported along, um, along the Caribbean, uh, my colleagues implemented at several 
sophisticated analysis with some currents and a lot of um, machine learning approaches so they can discover what are the, the current patterns that can transport sargassum and which of those are like barriers that for, for the transportation. So um, we have patterns, different patterns along the year how, um, that give us an idea how the, these pathways of sargassum are um, distributed along the Caribbean Sea. I'm um, sorry. Um, so these, um, these are the uh, Lagrangian coherent structures that tell us an idea where the sargassum can be accumulated because the, uh, yeah, the, these uh, current patterns. Okay, so I'm gonna um, bring this one. We don't exactly don't know how wind is affecting the, the sargassum transport. So uh, my colleagues did uh, an experiment, uh, several experiments, so we can um, see how sargassum is moving with the waves and winds, and for that matter, I'm going to go back a little bit. Uh, they designed a synthetic sargassum so they can make uh, these um, experiments on lab. Can you click on those two plays, on the, the other two images? Um, so, well, the experiments went about how waves affect the, the sargassum moment, how waves plus wind can, can yeah, how, how it, how it uh, in, has implications in the movement of sargassum and trying to understand which one of these factors is the most important one or how they uh, interact between between both. So uh, we can say with this experiment that uh, waves and wind are uh, important, but the current definitely is the thing that makes the sargasso moves faster. Well, the other big project that uh, the Institute has related with sargasso is the monitoring by fixed cameras. That is something that is working here, here with this um, Team, these cameras right now are just located at Puerto Morelos, a southern part of the coast of Mexico. But with this um, tiny project that started on 2015, um, they um, they have a lot of improvements to monitoring one beach for in regular basis. Uh, um, I mean, every 15 minutes, uh, a photo is taken. And then it's um, trans transformed in a plain uh, idea, so we can have the amount of sargassum that is on the beach. Um, well, the, this graph over here is the relation of the satellite detected sargassum with the, the sargassum that was arrived in in that area. So with this uh, with this project, we are trying to understand which are the main, the main factors that promote sargasso to beach on this particular area. So one of the, um, one of the results shows that higher energy conditions, meaning high waves, high currents, um, speed, uh, can um, make the sargassum land in a higher scale. Uh, finally, um, uh, this science, citizen science project is being implemented also in, in Mexican beaches with this um, cost nap um, installation so people can go to that area and take a photo and automatically upload that. Uh, in, with this project, the also People is being involved, schools, teachers, and the, the user of those areas. So the, the whole idea with all these advances is to have an early warning system with pretty accurate results for the area. We know that 
each segment of the uh, Mexican Caribbean has different um, factors implied in the Sargasso beaching. So we have to know which factors affect each area that are differentiated. So well, that's the whole idea. Thank you so much. Okay, good day everyone. Um, it is a pleasure to see a lot of familiar faces here. <laughs> um, I'm also glad, of course, to see some new faces as well, um, because you know we hope that you can disseminate this message to as many persons as possible. You know, after all, a system can only be useful if it is used by persons. Today, I will talk briefly about the purpose and develop, development methods put in place towards the development of JCs, which I will then follow with a live demo of the platform for users to showcase its capabilities. We'll also have a general question and answer section after this presentation and demo for all presenters um, at the end. All right, so let me see if I can use it. All right, good. So, we look at the purpose first. So, when we were thinking initially about the overall purpose of the Real Advisory System for Jamaica, we thought that, yes, you know, this is something Jamaica clearly needs. Saga is, to hear, is here to say, and it is a new normal we have to live with. So, an advisory system would, you know, obviously assist stakeholders to build resilience. This in itself would have been an accomplishment for Jamaica at the time, as then and before today, there is no local system which could assist in creating local alerts for the country. However, we wanted to make it more useful to the fishermen, tourism interests, and other coastal users who are facing increased risk of sargassum every day. And as such, we came to the idea that we had to include an aspect on beaching, which is where sargassum affects a majority of sectors is it's where it is most impactful as opposed to the floating sargassum. We also thought um, you know, that this information would be more useful and beneficial at a scale users could relate with. And as such, we conceptualized having the alert at a community level. So the, the outcome of which um, after much, much hard work, um, I, if, if I had to show you all the work we did, we'd, we'd be here for a while and we don't want that, right? So we are pleased to announce the outcomes of JCs that we have been successful in producing an early advisory system that not only predicts where sargassum is, is located offshore, but it also takes into account where Sargassum is likely to be near shore, which is a data gap across a lot of other early advice systems. It also takes into consideration the risk level of Sargassum beaching in a community. And the system is also innovative in that it provides alert for specific communities and the impacted stakeholders from that community. Please to announce and with some, you know, that at this time, this represents the only Sargassum early advice system developed in Jamaica for Jamaica, but the first Sargassum early advice system that encompasses predictions for near shore floating Sargassum, beaching, and the impact upon stakeholders. So, as I mentioned, there was a lot of work put into developing the system. I'm not sure if, it's, if you've seen correctly, but... <laughs> All right, there are three main things. <laughs> so, in the development of the system, um, there are three things that you, we need to understand. Most important, the geographical and temporal variation of where Sargassum is floating and beaching. 
if we understand that, we can begin to explore exactly what's causing the movement, you know, what's causing the beaching. So that was a very important step. We also needed to understand the hydrometeorological conditions associated with the beaching of Sargassum. And very importantly, you know, we can't develop a system without thinking about the stakeholders impacted. So how were these stakeholders impacted? How could the system be of benefit to them? Right. So I mentioned three key parameters a while ago. Um, just to ref ref refresh you. The geographical and temporal variation of sargassum. Um, the hydrometeorological conditions which influence sargassum movement and a socioeconomic exposure to sargassum. This resulted in a beaching risk value for our, our early advisory system on a scale of one to five, as well as a total social vulnerability volume, value for each community on a scale of one to five. Right. So, um, before developing the system, we saw it fit that the first thing we did was to identify from the representatives of affected stakeholders what they would want from the system. So I've actually, I've seen many of these um, faces leave institutions, come and leave new faces that isn't this. So this was at the start of the project. So we wanted to understand, you know, when, at what scale would they want alerts? The key challenges the members face and what parameters of sargassum were their members most interested in. So we met with the higher level stakeholders at this stage. So the representatives, so like the National Fisheries Authority, the Chambers of Commerce, NEPA of course, which has been very integral throughout the process. Right. Um, at this stage, the site looks nothing like this by the way. <laughs> um, we presented early mockups of the website, so you know, to garner that user feedback, exactly what are the functions and utilities of the website, you'd like to see what needs to go. Right. So we talk about um, understanding the, the, the variability of sagas and beaching events, which is very difficult and, um, to ascertain because, you know, the nature area is absent of, you know, quality satellite imagery. So, we broke up the coastline of Jamaica into 998 one-kilometer segments, which we then manually assess each segment every month over five years for the presence or absence of sargassum with the use of openly available planet imagery. At each step of the process, the use of open source data and technology were highly important as, you know, we, we had transferability in mind right throughout the development process. So um, this is just a map highlighting the geographic variability of sargassum beaching events across Jamaica and the severity. And I'm sure if you're familiar with sargassum in Jamaica, this map would make a lot of sense to you. Our southern sections are severely impacted, um, mo namely Hellshire and Salt River communities have been devastated in recent years. There's also the eastern coastline, you know, communities in Portland, Manchineal, Kensington are severely impacted by the sargassum. And then with our activities, we also identified some anomalies, communities in other areas that, you know, you see generally absent, but we're able to identify communities like Robbins Bay, Priory in St. Anne, and even Negril in Westmoreland that has been significantly impacted by sargassum. So, you know, with remote sensing data, there needs to be uh, validation work done. And as such, we utilized national reports from Nepal at the time, as well as we had to do our own field work to validate, further validate with confidence. So we actually developed and incorporated field methods utilizing machine learning technologies to quantify beach sargassum across monitoring sites to validate, you know, the geographic variability seen from remote sensing imagery. And we are pleased to announce that based on over 50 field validation exercises, 
that we can say with a statistical confidence that we are 90% accurate with what we're seeing from remote sensing imagery and real world beaching events. And from these activities, we have developed best practices for volume estimation, drone flights for sargassum quantification, and rapid assessment, which is very important for Nepal given their very large portfolio. Right, and you know, part of a project, you know, you need to talk about sustainability and legacy. Having developed these novel methods to monitor and quantify sargassum, we saw it fit to ensure that you know, these innovations are transferred sustainable. And as such, we met with Nepal for training sessions on how to monitor sargassum using line transects, drones, and rapid assessment forms. And through the SARTRAC project, we also donated various equipment which can be utilized for monitoring. Right, so we talk about the beaching, but the floating sargassum is very important as well. Um, so similar to Nepal, we had to, it's one of the first technologies that emerged. We had to use USF's algae density maps to ascertain the variability of sargassum offshore in 13 vector files developed in GIS. Every week over a five-year period, the same five-year period, we assessed the beaching events. Right, and I mentioned what we want to emphasize about this early advice system. We developed with, with stakeholders in mind. So an important part of that is ass assessing socioeconomic vulnerability. This was ascertained by asking socioeconomic questionnaires to fishermen. We've actually been to every fishing village in Jamaica impacted by sargassum. Tourism and community interest across Jamaica and the impact they're facing and adapt adaptation strategies that they have utilized. A socioeconomic exposure model of the coastline was also developed by mapping and incorporating every single asset, which turned out to be several thousands associated with fishing, tourism, coastal leisure, marine navigation, and critical infrastructure interests across the island. As a result of that, we are able to have a social vulnerability value of each community. And this was developed using JAMNAV, um, which is Jamaica's largest private GIS database. How is that um, MGI? Right. So as a scientist, I see many scientists here that I have you know, gone to school with and those ahead of me but I understand how difficult it is to you know, ascertain offshore conditions, especially the hydrometeorological data. So to understand this, we extracted over 50,000 data points a day, utilizing the storm glass API of various hydrometeorological conditions, and developed random forest models to understand the conditions associated with sargassum beaching our presence in a specific area. The result of this, which is very interesting, highlighted factors such as wind wave and current parameters as being more important for influencing sargassum presence in a specific area, which is very similar to what Abigail's model in Mexico, lab <laughs> models were showing just now. All right, so, so all of this now, um, we will need to bring up the website, I think we can have the users in the room access it now. It is at um, jcs.monagis.com. Okay, so all right, the site's up now, so if, if you gain access to it, so it's jses.monagis.com, jses.monagis.com. So if we scroll down the page, um, which is the home page, you'll see, scroll down, you'll see this map um, highlighting the coastline 
specific offshore and nearshore zones and the presence or absence of sargassum in those offshore zones. As well as if you hover over the community like this, you'll be greeted with, you know, it will display the community that you're hovering over and the beaching risk level for that community. And if you scroll a little bit down below the page, there is a key here highlighting, you know, that the orange colors and the red colors are indicating greater um, beaching severity. And the, the purple area in the offshore sectors, that's a major presence of dense sargassum mats. And the pink would be the minor presence of sargassum mats and white being absent. So this is an actual alert for January 2024. And as you can see, this year, we, it's a slow start to the sargassum year. There's not much floating sargassum around. But especially, we went there yesterday, in fact, the eastern side of the island around Portland and St. Mary actually has some. So we can expect next month those um, communities to have a higher level of beaching risk. Um, but the, the, commun the two communities, um, so if we go up, and there's another tab called National Bulletin. So this is another interaction the, the user may have with the website. It will give an overall summary of the specific offshore zones where there is major or minor presence of sargassum. There's a, it will also highlight the, the specific sectors where there's minor presence. It also tells you the exact zone shown in the previous map. It will show you the top 10 communities most affected by sargassum beaching risk. In this month, we can expect Hellshire and Albion to experience minimal levels of beaching, but chances of beaching is very likely. Um, we'll also see the specific coastal activities affected by those communities with a beaching risk, and whether or not um, transformational opportunities exist with the presence of offshore floating sargassum, which during our stakeholder consultations were very, that, that's where the interest was for using sargassum for transformational opportunities. All right, so if we scroll back up, we will see a community bulletin. But before I show you this, um, just go back to the home page. If we hover over a community along the coastline, you can click read more, and you'll be directed to the specific community alert that you're looking at you'll see all the specific coastal activities affected in that community. You'd see whether or not there is an offshore risk of sargassum. You will see the specific coastal activities affected. You will see um, here the beaching risk, as well as the, the socioeconomic exposure of that coastline. Um, what we saw fit from the many questionnaires that we did was to have some information on what affected stakeholders could do. So if you click on fishing, for instance, yeah, so if you click on that, or you click see details, yeah, it should, it should be clickable, yeah. It will go to a sectors on the risk page. So for under this page, it has information that we have ascertained from our surveys conducted on these six sectors that of interest. So fishing, tourism, um, coastal business, uh, coastal leisure, marine navigation, exactly what the risks are for beaching, floating, as well as the ad adaptive strategies that they utilize within their sectors. So you know, a fisherman might not be aware that he could do this thing um, in Manchineel and a man in Hellshire might have some information as well represented here on the website. So if we scroll up again um, and go back to the National Bulletin, we can see that um, it has also has information on the, 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 the top 10 communities. So just to explain that a little bit more, these are the top 10 by the beaching risk values. So for in general, there's not much high, there, there, there's a complete absence of level five beaching risk for all communities. 
only two with four, so Albion and Hellshire in St. Catherine. So if we scroll back up, um, we also have a about section, which you know I saved this section for last. You notice I didn't introduce the very hardworking team, and it has been a very hardworking team at MGI um, under the leadership of Luke Buchanan, myself, Ava, Dr. Ava Maxim, or you know recently a recent departed director. She was very instrumental for the development and oversight of the research into JCs. Darren, Ajani, Kishna, KUD, Kavya, and the other software development members. So it was a very integrated team from different um, academic backgrounds. So how can a user benefit from the system? Do they have to go to the site every time? No. So if you scroll up, you can see I subscribe to our newsletter um, option. So, yeah. It will just simply ask um, the user to enter their first name, last name, and their email. So with that information, you're logged or registered into the system. So every, t every month when we push an update to the system, you get an email about that alert um, so you can see it. And that is it for the main functions of the website. We will now ask the presenters to come to the front for our question and answer section. All right, thank you. Thank you for your time as well. I know we have gone over time a little bit, but we're closing now. Really appreciate the time that you took today. Um, we'll get right into it. Um, we'll take questions from the audience before we go online. Thank you. Let's just tell us your name, sir, and before you ask the question. Thanks. Okay, my name is Damian White. With the last presentation where you said um, go on to the website, um, talking more for citizen science, are there plans on making this application an app, which is more easier for us, for um, somebody to use? And the follow-up question um, with our Mexican colleague, she mentioned they put in barriers um, to um, to to stop like the saga from to come on beach. Do you have problems with the environmentalists talking about impact on marine fish or whales or stuff? Um, how do you mitigate that? Um, thanks for your question, Damien. Or should I say Rooster's Rail? <laughs> um, so the, this is just the initial um, version of the website. There are further plans for you know iterating and making it more improved. Um, we do plan on sending user surveys to get feedback on the website. So that's a um, recommendation of an application. There's also a recommendation um, as well that we are thinking about in future releases where if a person from a specific community alert goes over a value, they'll be alerted because they're specifically from that community. So things like that will be implemented in the these barriers and those are made by different companies with different approaches. So some of those can be more gently with the fauna fishes and stuff, but other um, other doesn't. It depends on the materials, the the curtain um, to to the bottom. So some models turns out that can be more friendly. And 
uh, but uh, and the reality, what has been seen in Mexico is that the fauna associated with sargassum abandon the the mat when the mat is coming to the to the shore. So uh, a lot of uh, tiny fishes and um, shrimps can be found on on the barriers, but most of them are um, tired, and so because they can move when the when the sargasso is um, is dying, they move. So it's not a big deal. Thank you. Uh, yeah, 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 and you need a uh, permit to 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 call to um, allow those barriers, and you have to have plans for monitoring and to contend any kind of, of problems. So yeah, there are regular <laughs> regulatory uh, statements so they can uh, achieve so they can have. And um, just to follow up with the mobile um, application question, so the website is mobile responsive now, so you can access it from a mobile device, just not an application as yet, yeah. Question from the audience? Pleasant morning to you all. Um, Anthony Drisdale representing the fishers. Uh, there's just one particular question that I have um, regarding the, that, um, the boat and the, the brake that is used, the instrument that is used to remove those sargassum. Um, I'm not quite certain if they're still available because you know most of these beaches around, they still have a lot of those gathering on the beach. And uh, even though the pictures show you for Elshire Fishing Beach, there are other beaches across the island, and in particular, Clarendon. So I don't know if they're available. I, I assume that there will be a cost to that. But you could um, brief me on that. Thanks. OK. Yeah. Yeah, so when I had um, presented the information relating to the Sarga boat, as they called it at the time, it's essentially when the government was exploring options um, for responding to the influx. And the discussions were around gathering the harvest in the Sarga some before it impacted the beach. When we had done the initial exploration, that, um, that image that I showed, that vessel, was an estimated cost of 750,000 USD just to acquire <laughs> the model that was shown. So you, you can imagine that after a while it was abandoned, especially when we started to investigate the costs for operation, getting it into the island, having someone that would have custody of it, as well as maintaining it, right? Um, so we had shelved it at the time, hoping that the follow-up discussions that we were having with local persons who were interested would have essentially resulted in an opportunity for us to still have it, um, but on a more private investment, right? So. Thank you. Um, Mike, I think we can hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we're taking the question. Um, Hi, morning, or afternoon actually. Michael McCarthy from Clean Harbors Jamaica Limited. So, as an owner of these actual vessels that you're looking to procure, are there plans to engage parties that already have the vessels on island and the technology such as the barriers and other methods to assist with your sargassum problems? Uh, 
So the most recent um, approach that has been taken is working with local communities. I kind of described it in when I presented about the arrangement that we had with TEF to earmark funds. Um, what has also happened is like um, entities such as TPDCO, they have mobilized um, projects to do beach cleanup activities, again, on the beach. So there has not been a recent plan to look into the whole issue of harvesting at sea, um, because in most recent years, especially since 2018, um, when the fund arrangement with TEF had come to an end, we had been working with local communities to get that opportunity. TEF and TPDCO as well, knowing the impact on the tourism sector, had identified funds to work um, led by them to do work um, in these areas that were impacted. Thank you. Crystal? Good day, everyone. Krista Campbell, Television Jamaica. So just following up, uh, Monique, on the questions that have been asked, um, are you guys considering exploring using fishermen to help collect the sargassum as they beach in their areas and possibly you know, paying them a stipend or at least giving them an earning potential from it, seeing that their sector is particularly impacted? That's one. That's for you. And then for Romario, um, Romario sorry, the local aspect of the advisory system. So I know you said they have a community um, outreach aspect of it, or you know, the uh, community advisory part. Um, will it pl do you plan to roll it out publicly so you know all members of the public you know can access it, or is it that you're going to be encouraging persons to subscribe? And then also, have you reached out to other countries in the region to allow them to benefit, seeing that you know the Caribbean region is so impacted by sargasso? Thank you, Krista. So, um, and I'm, I'm using recent examples, but um, in most cases that we're now treating with where persons reach out to the agency about sargassum, it's more about advising them, right? It's not actually, we, we have not gotten much requests recently as it relates to many requests recently as it relates to funding some of the activities even when we had the funds set aside up until 2018 i think we had only assisted groups that were able to come together in saint mary and portland right because what we find is that and it, it was a part of the data that we had gathered when we were doing our quality quarterly monitoring is that persons who are operating on the beach are trying to manage the situation by doing daily cleanups, right? And we advise them about the burial on the back shore or carting it off to an area so that it dries and reintroducing the sun. So initially we had that aggressive call to help us to fund or it's a government's you know, primary responsibility. But with the education, the sensitization, what we found is that we are getting more requests now for guidance about doing cleanup activities. Um, that is not to say that we don't have a responsibility to help local communities where those um, issues arise. Um, and then again, we would look back at the relationship that we have with TEF and the TPD to identify these areas as target areas when they're doing um, their outreach and their support. Um, but in recent, I, I must say since 2018, and I've, our team has been the, the team at the front of this, it's, it's mostly been about guiding persons about how they go about managing the situation. Yeah. And um, just to add to that, you know, if the fishermen are very involved and eager to help with Sargassum. I know the Mansion New Fishermen Association, for instance, they come together and clean the beaches themselves. So, you know, a little support and push, it's a very good idea to do that um, initi initiative. Um, so the question was about the system being fully accessible. So it is fully accessible now on web, web um, you can just go on the website and subscribe. Um, it's fully available on desktop 
on laptop devices and most features are available on a mobile device now. So it is available, anyone in the world can subscribe. There's no geographic restriction to subscription, yeah. Is it Damien, right? Yeah. yeah. So just to follow up question. So I do a lot of stuff with citizen sciences and get a lot of information. So for example, you have this system. Um, make sure you put in literacy in it. And the second thing is about internet. Um, yes, a number of people might out there not going to have um, internet capabilities. So if they are collecting some information for you, you have to factor in that. My question to my Ghanaian colleague, I was interested in what they did with their, could you explain to us um, the citizen scientist aspect of your presentation? How do you reach out to the people on the beach. I'm here from Jamaica. I would, I would love to hear that aspect of it. So that's my question to you, your experience. Um, thank you for your question. Um, back in Ghana, um, those we are dealing with, they basically live along or close to the beach. So we have fishing communities along the beach. We have schools that are sometimes about 100 meters from the beach. So what we do is we do a survey to find out which schools are appropriate, which beach areas are appropriate to set up our um, coast nap points. Then we identify a school. We go in there, educate the teachers, educate the pupils. We also did some donations to them in terms of um, tablets, a phone, and then um, laptops, and then we actually train them on how to go to the coast, put the phones in the snap, and then take the pictures, and then send them. So for us, we, we deal with people who are virtually along the coast, and we get a lot of schools that are along the coast, but you have to get places where the people are willing to be part of the project and well and ready to, you know, advance it. Yes. Do you give them money for the data, the phone? Do you give them money for that? Or they, that aspect of it? Like? Okay, you go ahead. <laughs> so this cost a SNAP project, initially, yes. So uh, we provide them uh, the hardware and at least a one-year data plan to keep things going. Uh, so just to follow on what, what my colleague saying is, we already started, uh, we installed a few of these points in Mexico. And next week, one of my colleagues would be here. Uh, so they will be talking to one or two schools where they will be installing some of those points in Jamaica as well. So it will be very good to interact with you and, and involve you in that discussion if you like. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. All right, great. Are there any other questions from the audience? Um, I have a question, Jadu. Um, what are the opportunities? Um, um, are, there, are there any upcoming things at the University of Southampton and your colleagues in, in Britain that might be of use for us in Jamaica or in, in, in West Africa? Thank you. Uh, look, as I said uh, in my presentation, the key uh, next step is to, um, to scale up uh, the JSS to other countries. And that's why uh, what we'll be doing is we'll be working with colleagues in Ghana and Mexico as a starting point. And the whole ethos behind was uh, open source and open data, so everybody that we develop here can be used. And, and Jamaica is leading that at the moment, so I must congratulate the team on that. So that's one aspect. So we make a procedure for it to be more uh, transferable. The second aspect we'll be looking into is uh, involving citizen science, so particularly Jamaica. So we will be setting up a few more monitoring stations where we'll be collecting automated data from this coastal community. So rather than re reporting you, you should have information when they arrive. And again, those things would be openly and freely available and, and involving more. And hopefully at some point we can integrate those citizen science observations into JSAS as well. Thank you. All right, I think we have 
two questions from online came in by YouTube Live. Um, Emma Tompkins, which is your colleague, one of our colleagues on this project. So the first question is to Nepo. Um, let me get that for you. Um, so I think she's saying that in the presentation, um, the guidance advises against the use of heavy machinery, but um, but it, it's recognized that it's needed. Um, how often um, can every equipment be used, even though it's restricted? And um, so that's one. Um, and she's also asking if manual raking is feasible by the fishermen. And the third one, I hope you're remembering all of them, is heavy equipment, if this, it is needed, um, can damage mitigation techniques be developed to su support beach stability? Um, and also address biodiversity issues. So most, um, all, of, all of the questions are related. Thank you for that. So just to clarify, um, the first guidance that we issue in the wider notification to the public does stipulate the, pref the preferred methodology. What it also states is that if there is need for use of heavy machinery, you will now have to directly contact NEPA and we would issue that permission with the mitigation stipulations. So you're using the heavy machinery, you're using it to um, remove the, the material to a certain point, not digging down into the sand, so you're, you're reducing the amount of sand that you're removing. You are traveling on the beach in a particular pathway so that you're compacting just one area of the beach in terms of when you're moving that machinery along the beach, as well as disposal sites, how you treat with it at the disposal site, and the possibility of putting it back on the beach so that you're reducing the impact on the beach. But at that, at that stage, we would want to have direct interaction with the persons that are doing that nature of work. So the, the wider guidance that we issue to the public um, it does stipulate that for use of heavy machinery, at that point in time, you write to the agency, describe the situation. In most instances, persons provide us with images of the beach that they wish to clean up. And on th when we examine that case, we will issue the permission letters. Yeah. Is it enough for um, NEPA to send them guidelines or would you need somebody there to come and what we do have in some instances are officers that visit the locations as well. And, and some persons will ask that Nepal personnel um, visit the location and provide guidance because they contract persons to do the cleanup. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Again, um, I'll invite, if there are no more questions, no more questions? Great. I'll invite my colleague, um, Mr. Darren Fletcher, who has been working with us over several years on Sargassum initiatives, to bring the closing remarks and, and say thank you. I actually didn't plan on carrying my laptop here, but because everybody came and presented with a laptop, might as well. Just, uh, yeah. Kyoto told me before I presented that I needed to provide comedic relief, so here we are. <laughs> we are at the end, and thank God. So to all of our specially invited guests, friends, colleagues, well-wishers, and attendees, pleasant, good, Afternoon. I am Darren. I am technical project, project coordinator at MGI and one of the key contributors in the development of the Jamaica Sargassum Early Advisory System, JCs. It's been a long road and we're not at the end, but a major milestone has been, has been accomplished. So on behalf of, of the JC's team, it is my pleasure to deliver the vote of thanks and my closing remarks for the launch of this system. Essentially, big up, who needs big up? Beforehand. JC's is the product of SciTrack, a three-year program of research starting all the way in November 2019, funded by the Economic and Social Research Council, 
Global Challenges Research Fund that is being delivered through a worldwide collaboration among the University of Southampton, University of Ghana, University of West Indies, and University of York with a strong focus on the potential role of Sargassum in offering a transformation opportunities to the poorest communities in Sargassum affected areas across the tropical Atlantic basin. Now with that mandate set, JCS is an innovative system which will assist with the early detection of Sargassum and timely dissemination of alerts to the most vulnerable groups in our society and to the wider general public. Therefore, on behalf of the JCS team, I would like to thank our funders, the Economic and Social Research Council, for providing funding for this very important initiative. We have built a system which we hope will revolutionize the way we manage our shores against the threat of sargassum. A special thanks goes out to all of our SARTRAC research partners, University of Ghana, University of York, Center for Marine Sciences based here in Jamaica, and the Center for Resource Management and Environmental Studies, CERMES, based in Barbados, and of course, our lead partner, the University of Southampton, for their stellar work over the years, long years, and long may SARTRAC legacy survive and thrive. I would also like to thank all of our stakeholders across the varying sectors who participated in our JC's specification and requirement sessions and focus group discussions. Many thanks to the ecosystems management team from NEPA for their efforts and support in the development of a synchronous method in monitoring sargassum locally. This was a critical step as we will be able to adequately evaluate the problem of sargassum and develop effective management strategies to alleviate the issues arising from this problem. Special mention goes out to all agencies, groups, individuals who assisted with our early advice system field validation efforts, to the communities, to the people, to the local bodies that provided us access to some of these sites that Romario carried me to in some very precarious places. Thank you for, you know, keeping us safe. You know, very much to thank you for your contributions. Over the years, we have engaged with, as Romario mentioned, every single fishing community across Jamaica that has been affected by Sargassum. Sargassum has taken Romario and I across all 14 parishes in, in the country. And with that said, special thanks has to go to our local fishing cooperatives, especially the Manchineal fishing community for their continued support um, throughout the entire project. Without, without everyone's input, the system just would not have been possible. To our speakers, Monique, Jadu, Mawe, Abigail, and Romario, thank you for setting the Sargassum stage upon which Jamaica has and will be for the foreseeable future, an unwilling participant, but also for, for providing hope that through our combined efforts, we can find a way, well, not just our way, but ways of mitigating the effect of Sargassum. Special thank you to everyone who has contributed in some way to the execution of this launch. Thank you for the food, thank you for the water, thank you for the equipment, thank you for the mic. All your efforts are you know, very much appreciated. Now with that said, I ask that we all please give a warm round of applause to the JC's team from University of Southampton and MGI. A lot, a lot of hard work, miles, many journeys, many backbreaking efforts, sweat, many, many, many hot days, many, many rainy days, many, many cold days as well, as well as tears went into the development of this system. And we are very proud to have it officially launched to you, the public, so you guys can stay and be informed. Now to all present, 
and those watching online, I now ask you to use the system. We didn't build it for no reason at all. So the system is for you, it's for all of us. Become a subscriber, be a user. Tell a friend to tell a friend to tell a friend. Engage with your local coastal community, but most importantly, stay informed. I thank you in advance for the contributions you will make to your community, to your business, to Jamaica, and to the world at large using our platform. I now encourage you to have a drink, get something to eat. It's been a long day. Thank you.